and the product that is generated from a uh, ionic adsorption clay as a mixed rare earth oxide or a mixed rare earth carbonate has a high payability because um, it doesn't have any of that intermediate processing requirement with the, the high capital and the high operating cost intensity of the, of the cracking process. Well, hello sure. and welcome to Assay TV. Uh, today, I'm delighted to be joined by Tim Harrison, who is the Managing Director of Ionic Rare Earths. Uh, Tim, great to see you. Joining us from Melbourne today. Yeah, g'day, Leo. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, we're here to talk about your Makutu project in Uganda, a rare earth project there. Um, if we could just sort of start things off, if you can just give us a, a brief sort of overview of the Makutu project uh, and what you've found so far. So Makutu is a large ionic adsorption clay located about 120 kilometres east of the, the capital in Uganda, Kampala. Um, so the project is a, a large um, ionic adsorption stretches about 37 kilometres in length from, from one end to the other. Uh, very shallow deposits, uh, typically about three metres of cover. And underneath, we've got a clay zone that averages around about 12 metres of thickness. Um, and it's in this clay zone that we've got a deposit that's built up a, a composition of, of heavy and uh, light rare earths. Um, Makutu is well su uh, supported by available and existing infrastructure. And we have been working through an, in, um, an earning arrangement over the course of the last 18 months um, to de-risk the project and increase our stake in, uh, in the Makutu project. Mm. And I understand you've just received another two exploration licenses, which should uh, allow you to expand your uh, exploration corridor there. That's right. So the, the two new exploration licenses that have been awarded um, early this year, um, on the back of that, we've gone back and recalculated the exploration target for, for Makutu, and that's seen a 50% increase in the, um, the potential size of the project. Um, Mineralisation corridor was previously 26 kilometres. That's now stretched out to 37 kilometres. Uh, it's a, a long, continuous... Um, mineralisation of clay um, and you know that, that new exploration ground provides us with immense capability to bring online potentially additional modules um, and look at ramping up the overall scale of the project you know in a much more aggressive fashion. Mm. So you've been drilling all the way through 2020 how many holes have you drilled and how many how many meters? Okay, so we started the drill program, the phase two, uh, phase two drill program in, in March. Uh, we got about 11 holes in before we had to suspend activities due to COVID. Um, we were patiently waiting and then resumed uh, drilling in July. All in, um, we do, drilled another 222 holes. Um, the project, that phase two drill program was 4,000 metres. So the typical average depth is around about 17 metres. So it's a very shallow deposit. Um, and all of that new drilling data is, is slowly filtering in now. We've received five of the, the seven um, drill assay tranches to date, two more to go, and then we'll be launching into a, a material increase in the mineral resource estimate. Hmm. Um, and do you have, I mean, I know in, in many parts of the world, there's a bit of a delay on assays coming back from labs at the moment because there's so much exploration activity going on. How's the situation with you guys in Uganda? That's right. So um, all of our drill core, uh, so our drill program was diamond core. Um, we've then um, cut the core and transported half of it back to Australia where uh, a quarter goes for assay and a quarter um, we're using for metallurgical test work. We are getting through that assay uh, now. It's been a little bit slower over the course of the last three months. Um, and that's just the, the, the labs are being completely inundated here in Australia with all of the activity in other areas, especially gold. Mm. And in terms of the metallurgical test work you've been doing, um, what does it show that your clays contain? Okay, so the, the metallurgical test work, um, very simple, basic salt desorption uh, test work, which is effectively salt washing of the ore. Um, and that salt washing is stripping um, a significant portion of the rare earths from the clay into the solution. And then from there, 
um, we're able to recover the rare earths as a, as a mixed rare earth carbonate product. So it's a very simple process. What we typically see is we're seeing uh, elevated extractions of heavy rare earths compared to the light rare earths. Typically, the heavy rare earths have a, have a recovery of or extraction of double that of the light rare earths. And we've seen results up to sort of 75% total rare earth um, recovery minus cerium. Typically, we discount cerium because the, the cerium in, exists in an ionic absorption clay, typically as a cerionite, so it's a, a cerium oxide, and usually quite refractory to, to the very simple processing conditions that we test. So um, the, the metallurgy of the, of the project in, and an ionic absorption clay is very simple. Um, and so we're looking at a process uh, akin to, uh, if you consider a, a heap leach. Uh, so very low capital, uh, low operating cost, and, and quite a simple process for us to be able to recover quite a significant amount of, of critical and heavy rare earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you brought up an interesting uh, point there. You're working with ionic absorption clays. Um, can you explain to us, uh, the, you know, the difference between them and, uh, you know, other sort of hard rock deposits uh, in terms of, you know, ease of processing costs and also some of the, some of the, I know with some of the hard rock uh, material, uh, you get sort of thorium and uranium and things like that associated. Can you tell us what are the benefits of the, the, the IAC uh, deposits? Okay, so um, effectively an ionic absorption clay, the rare earths existing in the clay lattice in a chemical form. So very different to a hard rock project where the rare earths are existing in a mineral form. Um, so with an ionic absorption clay, we're simply washing or we're exchanging the rare earths that exist in a chemical form um, with a, a salt and that goes into solution and then we recover the solution and precipitate the rare earths. There's no uh, or very little um, uranium and thorium in the ore and that stays with the residue. So we don't have any radionuclides following the, the rare earths, which means that we don't have any of those legacy issues that are associated with processing of, of hard rock mineral concentrates. Talking of those hard rock mineral concentrates, um, so, uh, the hard rock projects, they have the rare earths that exist in, you know, the most common uh, rare earth minerals being basnesite, uh, monazite or, or xenotime. And, and those minerals require a, a, a destruction of, of the mineral to, in order, uh, to enable the uh, rare earths to be liberated from the mineral so that they can then be recovered. In order to um, process a, a hard rock rare earth, First, they typically use a beneficiation step, so a crushing and grinding process, then try and concentrate the rare earth minerals. Then once they've concentrated those rare earth minerals, there's a cracking process whereby they use um, elevated temperatures and reagents, quite aggressive conditions. Those minerals also contain um, uranium and thorium. And so you then have issues with the, the release and, and the uh, release of those radionuclides into the, into the residues. Um, so the, the typical requirements on, on processing a, a hard rock mineral concentrate are substantially more capital intensive um, than they are for an ionic absorption clay. Typically your operating cost is, is higher because you're using such aggressive conditions um, and you have an ongoing liability with regards to your management of radionuclides. So if you look at some of the facilities around the world that have processed large amounts of rare earth mineral concentrates, um, certainly Bay and Obo up in Inner Mongolia, um, and you know some of the Australian investors will be more familiar with Linus and some of the issues that they've had to deal with in Malaysia. Mm. So um, they are, that's a function of, of uh, processing those hard rock mineral concentrates. Um, they're the major differences. When you start to look at the, the value that you would achieve from the two products or the two type of, of, of mineralizations, um, typically an ionic absorption clay has a much higher basket price. And that's driven by the fact that there's a higher proportion of heavy rare earths. Mm. Um, and the product that is generated from a uh, ionic absorption clay 
as a mixed rare earth oxide or a mixed rare earth carbonate has a high payability because um, it doesn't have any of that intermediate processing requirement with the, the high capital and the high operating cost intensity of the, of the cracking process. So um, the products can sort of go into a, a downstream processing plant more readily. Um, and those um, products from a, an ionic absorption clay typically have a higher payability. Mm. So not only do you get the benefit of a higher basket price, but you actually get more in your pocket as a producer of those products. They're more favourable, more highly desired, and um, don't have any of the, the downstream processing complexities associated with the, the, the lower payable, um, more uh, challenging processing environment of having to process those um, mineral concentrates. Mm. And in terms of the, the world supply of uh, heavy rare earths, uh, you know, how much comes from ionic uh, absorption phase? 95% uh, of the world's heavy rare earths emanates from uh, the ionic absorption clays of southern China. Mm. So um, they're a, a, an extremely strategic resource that China has safeguarded over the course of the last 15 years. Um, over mining and illegal mining of these um, deposits in southern China was one of the prime catalysts for the initiation of the, the quotas back in 2006. And um, in efforts to try and curtail the, the rate at which those strategic ionic absorption clay deposits were being depleted, they've started to, to, to reduce the amount of ionic absorption clay uh, ore that was processed. And so you've gradually seen the quotas of ionic absorption clays reduce over time. Um, I think around about 2006, about 30% of the uh, rare earth production emanated from these ionic absorption clays. And today it's about 14%. So they've reduced the amount of production from these ionic absorption clays and increased the production from the more readily scalable mineral concentrates derived from, say, Bayanovo, which produces around about 70% of China's rare earth production. Mm. Um, and I understand that, I mean, you also have scandium uh, in your project. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what, you, what you're planning to do with that. Yeah, so scandium, um, so I've had a bit of experience with scandium in the past and I'm a, I'm a believer in, um, in the, the potential for aluminium scandium alloys to, to be quite a, a big player in um, lightweighting automotive and, and um, aerospace travel in the future. Um, we're looking at producing um, a small amount of scandium initially and, and potentially being able to scale that up over time. Um, initially, we'd probably look at, a, um, depending on who we partner with strategically, the scandium may end up going with our bulk uh, rare earth, uh, mineral, mineral rare earth carbonate, um, or depending on where we see the opportunity for the downstream scandium market, we may decide to look at um, strategies to extract scandium at the mine site as a standalone product that we could then market directly. Mm. And in terms of your, you mentioned your background there, um, to sort of tell our viewers, you, you were the sort of head of process development at, uh, at Cleantech, where they have their yeah, little quite... cobalt scandium deposits. So in terms of sort of separating metals and things like that, that's your, that's your, uh, your bag. That's right. So I've had a bit of, uh, bit of fun to be had um, trying to separate uh, uh, scandium from um, from all sorts of things at um, at uh, at CleanTech, um, and uh, you know probably developed quite a good appreciation of what the scandium market could be. Mm. Um, and I've seen quite favourably. I mean, there's been some recent activity in the space where where Rio Tinto is actually um, going to be producing scandium, which is great for the industry. And um, and I think a project like Makutu has the ability to also produce quite a significant amount of low-cost scandium to really be a, a catalyst for supporting a more wide-scale adoption of aluminium scandium alloys. Mm, absolutely. And Uganda is a place to uh, mine. H how is it as a jurisdiction? Yeah, so we've had a lot of uh, very encouraging discussion with the Ugandan governments and different authorities um, within Uganda. Um, Uganda has had a lot of mining in, in, in the past. Um, probably for the last 30 to 40 years, 
um, that international investment hasn't been there. And over the course of the last 10 years, the Ugandan government has been doing a lot of activity to try and stimulate international investment. Uh, presently, there's, um, there's three international companies, um, Australian listed companies that are in Uganda exploring, ourselves, Javwa and, uh, and SIPA. Um, we know that there's a number of other international companies within Uganda that has uh, been doing work in more of the, the industrial mineral space, so vermiculite, uh, phosphates, um, and so the, that uh, mining industry and mining investment in, in Uganda is, is quite formative, but has a tremendous amount of support from the Ugandan government to build and, and, and I think to, to try and develop their, their inherent resources within Uganda. Mm. Um, I think we see it as being a, a huge opportunity to be one of the first countries in there to, and to be a partner with the Ugandan government to try and build that capability, um, develop their people and um, you know, ultimately try and, and build some uh, long-term industry within, within Uganda. Mm. So what are your next steps for, for 2021? I mean, you've done a scoping study, I believe, on the project. What, what are your next steps towards moving that forward? Yeah, so we completed a scoping study, which was um, a requirement for us to um, renew the, the main Makutu Central licence. Um, we did an interim study and we're now in the process of updating that study. We've now pulling the, the, the remaining drill assay data in. We'll do a substantial mineral resource estimate um, in the next six weeks. On the back of that, we will then do a, a scoping study update where we're hoping to have that out by the end of the quarter. Um, beyond that, we're looking at drilling. Um, so looking at some exploration drilling on that, that new um, eastern uh, exploration licence we've recently been awarded. So very keen to, uh, to, to get the drill rigs out and um, just test how big that's going to be. Um, and effectively launching proper into the bankable feasibility study. So we've got um, our environmental and social impact assessment that's been initiated and uh, a lot of activity to support expediting the development of the project um, and ultimately working towards a point where we can support an application for a mining licence within the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. So we're very keen on fast-tracking the project we see a huge opportunity to supplement declining rare earth supply or heavy rare earth supply out of China. And a project like Makutu offers, um, you know, a number of strategic partners the ability to, to be self-reliant and self-dependent on the heavy rare earth requirement going forward to support initiatives in, um, you know, green power, um, defence applications and communications. So uh, it's a tremendous opportunity and it's great to be involved with a project like Makutu that's it's going to bring a, a low capital, low operating cost project um, in the right commodities at the right time mm. um, and, and a unique project that, that complements an industry that really hasn't put its finger on how it's going to find the critical and rare earths um, that the world's going to need going forward. Mm. Well, nicely summed up there. I mean, so you've got lots of news flow uh, on the way uh, at a time when when there is a you know lot of demand for rare earths and some tightness on the supply side. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today and explaining us uh, all about uh, explaining to us all about your project. I look forward to seeing the news uh, as it comes out over the next few weeks and months. Thanks, Leo, and look forward to keeping you updated. Thank you, Tim.